All right. So uh, thank you for joining me, Vic. Uh, so this is uh, Ramadan. So happy Ramadan for Same those who are fasting. Pleasure. And uh, so it would be a timely manner to introduce ourselves. But the title is about uh, reprogram metabolism and how appropriate during the month of Ramadan, because fasting is one of the best ways to initiate that reprogramming. So I am uh, a MD uh, specializing in internal medicine, but with a very deep um, uh, dive into more natural approaches to get to the root of the problem. And that's what you're going to find out. If you find out what the root of the problem is, you can actually fix it, you can prevent it, you can reverse it. And so I have with me uh, my good friend and expert in uh, exercise and nutrition is Victor. So Victor and, and I have known each other for some time. So I, I strongly believe in lifestyle. So we're going to give you both the medical angle, the natural angle, the nutrition angle and the fitness angle. So we're trying to get all that in one hour, but you know, we will have to continue this conversation for the subsequent episodes. So welcome Victor and uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, thanks so much, doc. Uh, like you mentioned, um, I am an exercise and lifestyle specialist. That's what I consider myself. My background in education is in exercise sciences, exercise physiology, and then it's been a lifelong journey in terms of continuing to educate myself um, and those around me, my clients as well. And as you alluded to, um, we believe that there's much to be gained from determining how to reprogram our health and our wellness that started to slide so far off track in this country in particular through natural means. And a lot of times, um, unfortunately, in my opinion, that's not the first step that's taken in traditional medical approaches to curing or treating illness and diseases of all kinds. And when you look at our population as a whole, we're sicker than ever. So with that being said, like you said, no, no better time than when folks such as yourself and myself, I do this every day anyways, are focusing on trying to reprogram uh, spiritually, physically, mentally. Um, and interestingly enough, just talking about fasting and Ramadan, um, there have been plenty of studies done looking at the productivity of individuals during the month or the during the during Ramadan holiday and massive increases in productivity. And I don't know if that's because people are hungry and they're just trying to keep themselves distracted from wanting to eat or what else there is going on there. And, and you and I both know that there's a lot more going on there than just that. There's there's some serious physiological mechanisms going on um, there as well. So we'll, we'll get into the deep dive, but I just want to keep it simple to begin with. As an MD, you know, I see a lot of pathology and we call it the cardiometabolic spectrum because the metabolic spectrum ranges from just the weight gain and then further down into blood pressure, then heart disease, as well as diabetes. And so there really is a big spectrum. That's probably, you know, 70% of primary care. And I wanted to keep it simple. I think the simple way to look at it is metabolism is the way your mitochondria makes energy. And you may think, well, that seems quite alien to blood pressure. My doctor never talked about mitochondria when it comes to blood sugar. Well, that's why they have never been able to fix it for you. So uh, metabolism would be the core thing in the middle and its function will determine the cardiometabolic spectrum. When that fails, when that is inefficient, your doctor will make your diagnosis and put you on prescription medication. So if you listen carefully, you're going to find out the causes of these problems, and therefore you should be able to address them. Therefore, you, you should be able to either prevent them or reverse them by yourself. And I'm going to have Victor start very soon about, about what type of um, exercise actually during Ramadan. Then we're, the nutrition will be the, really the nitty gritty of how to reprogram the cells. Fasting is a different type of nutrition, not eating it that activates certain pathways then when you eat that's a different pathway we need to pay attention to what we eat that will be part of it so let me uh, let uh, victor introduce uh, what type of exercises are okay when somebody's not eating or drinking can they exercise this is a simple question absolutely yes very this might seem overly simplistic but listening to your body is oftentimes the best place to start so when individuals are in a fasted state obviously generally speaking access to fuel is a little bit more limited. But for folks who are used to or have been practicing fasting for an extended period, for example, during Ramadan, your body starts to do a bunch of interesting things, right? One of which it starts to figure out what other fuel sources it has access to in the absence of 
food in the gut and it starts to become more efficient at utilizing those types of fuels for energy, right? So some folks may have heard the term ketogenesis or ketosis. Those are two different terms, but often uh, used interchangeably, incorrectly, but they both refer to this concept that the body has access to fat stores, whether they're dietary fats that you ingest, or like I said, they're stored body fat, and it has the ability to break those substances down into other substances, which it can then utilize for energy purposes, right? But when it comes to exercise in a fasted state, I'd say, first of all, take your time. Um, something as simple as a walk before or after prayer, something like that is actually a really good way to even further improve the efficiency with which your body can utilize those stored sources of energy. Um, contrary to what some people might think, it may seem counterintuitive, but even brief bouts of intense exercise. So something a lot of people are familiar with the term HIIT training, high intensity interval training. So something like 10 minutes of trying to get your heart rate pretty high relative to what it's able to, to do for 10 to 30 seconds at a time, followed by maybe one, two, three minutes of recovery. So for example, that could look like uh, before or after prayer, somebody goes outside and there's street lights down the street and they're 50 yards apart and they sprint to a street light or push themselves. They work really hard to get from one street light to the next. And then they walk for a couple and they let their heart rate start to come back down towards resting levels. And then they repeat that. And then you could do three or four of those. It takes no more than five or 10 minutes. And that's a really good way to jumpstart the metabolism. Um, the other aspect of that exercise is that it's, I call it brain juice. It's a great way to get the body and the mind in a positive state moving forward for the rest of the day. And I also like to call it money in the bank. So just like getting up and having prayer done before the sun rises or going and getting a good workout in before everybody else is up, you've already made a deposit for yourself, for your health, for your wellness before most people are even comfortable with the idea of getting out of bed. And those sorts of disciplines practiced with consistency oftentimes can lead to monumental shifts in your overall health and wellness. So to sum that up, exercise in a fasted state could look like anything ranging from a, a 20 minute walk at a very leisurely pace to a modest weight training session where maybe you go in and you do two or three sets of reasonably challenging movements with a reasonably challenging load, a couple of sets of squats, a couple of sets of deadlifts, or a couple of sets of a push and a pull for some upper body stuff, or a combination of those things that last no more than 20 or 30 minutes to 10 minutes of interval sprints followed by periods of walking, 10 second maximal efforts, followed by plenty of recovery time. So it, it really just, you have to listen to your body and you have to take your time, start small and then progress from there. Great advice. I think uh, the operative word, listen to the body. And, uh, and, and the fact is that you can exercise, but it depends on your level when you, before you even get into Ramadan and how much you, uh, you got, got used to the fasting. So I'll give you an example of what happened with me. So I'm usually fairly regular with my workout, you know, four to five days a week, and I mix up the cardio and the strength on the same day. I don't have separate days. So what I found was that in the first week of fasting, I, when I went to the gym, it was like dying because I think the body was going through the change. And I think the biggest change for me is the hydration. I don't think it was the food because I do intermittent fasting. So I, bear, I don't eat all day long, no breakfast, no lunch. And I, then I work out in, in, a, in, a, in a wet fast, I should say. And, and I have no problems with the workout. But during Ramadan, because I'm not drinking anything, that is when my body really... So I was happy to have done it. So it's just my body was getting used to that type of exercise. But it was very low weight and it was I was fairly exhausted. The cardio was maybe 10 minutes when I would do at least 20 minutes. And so then the second week, I found that I had more strength and more endurance. And so the, uh, and then by the third week, I'm back to normal. Yeah, and what happens in the third week is that our month Ramadan gets a little more, more challenging because we have to stay up later at night. That sleep disruption is another stress that your body has to get used to. And again, I just did my second uh, routine in the last 10 days, and I've got probably at least two more where I'm back to my full strength, except 
this is the critical part. I think you have to know what your baseline is before you go to Ramadan. I think you got to know if you can get into that fasted state and how long it takes you to get adjusted to it. I'm used to fasting because I don't eat generally. So it didn't take, I still took me a week to get used to it. So it may take people longer. I think that's why, you know, spiritually we actually say that we should practice fasting before Ramadan. So we're really ready. And my wife always hammers me about getting ready, but I know I can just get it done. I just suffer a little bit, get it done, and then we can still spend time on the spiritual side. So the, the two things is um, you should get your body gradually into it. You can expect to build up the strength uh, as your body is acclimatizing. But I found that I, I needed a little bit more time of rest between my sets. So the, uh, the cardio actually was surprisingly good, and I was sweating, which I found surprising. Because if you've lost, I lose about three pounds of water. How do I know? because I look at the scale at the beginning of the day when I start my fast, and I look at the scale before I finish my fast, there's a three pound difference. There could be a little bit more. And, uh, you, and I knew when I was much younger, when I used to go running and I would sweat very heavily, three pounds would be the maximum. So that's like, you know, one hour of cardio and deep sweating was three pounds of sweat, which is equivalent to fasting at a leisurely place all day long, three pounds <laughs> of sweat. So nothing yeah. much has changed. But the right. key thing is that take it easy, um, spend a little bit more time recovering between sets. And I like to mix the cardio and the strength, but whatever it is that you want to do. And then after you answer the next phase, I'll just go into some of the medical stuff that goes on whilst you're fasting. Go ahead, Vic. Sure. No, I, I think that you summarized that the same way that I would. For all intents and purposes, fasting is a stressor, just like the exercise is itself. But as it relates to resetting our metabolism, um, one of the things that some folks may or may not know is that metabolism is primarily controlled um, by the mitochondria. And the mitochondria are a very specific part within every cell of the body. And it is responsible for converting those fuel sources that we talked about, whether they be ones that we're actually eating when we're eating or ones that we already have access to that our body can create when we're fasted um, and converting those into ATP, which is the usable source of energy, right? And generally speaking, we call that cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is taking what we need to make fuel and turning it into fuel. So when you are in a fasted state, the fuel sources that we tend to have access to, okay? So I mentioned some of them before, ketone bodies that are a byproduct of converting fats into energy, um, that, that ketosis, the, the breakdown of those substrates and using those for fuel, or something like gluconeogenesis, which is the creation of glucose in the liver, those are relatively slow processes. So like you were saying, you need to sort of modulate your intensity and your tempo so that you can continue to produce the energy that you need to do the exercise that's required. So again, if you feel like you're a little bit weaker or you're a little bit more tired, you're a little bit more sluggish, that's okay. Be consistent with it because your body will adapt to that stressor just like it will any other stressors. And exercising in that fasted state will do two things. One, it will create the sort of stress that your body will then respond to in becoming more efficient with providing fuel in a fasted state and utilizing that fuel. And not only that, some of those deeper mechanisms, the things like mitochondrial biogenesis, mitochondrial protein synthesis, the things that actually take the fuel sources and convert them into usable fuel start to become more efficient. And not only that, sometimes it helps us proliferate or, or create more of those, right? Yeah. Well, this, so this is the thing, you know, people feel weak during Ramadan. Is it the, a psychological weakness? Is it a dehydration? Is it a slowing metabolism? These are very good questions. And I think we have answers to these things right now. So, you know, when it comes to metabolism and fasting, um, you know, any stress actually is good for the body. When you fast, you actually are activating your mitochondria because during fasting, you actually produce something called NAD. NAD is the fuel that helps the mitochondria get that electron transfer chain. The, the whole mechanism of getting energy is through electrons transporting and it needs NAD. And so sure. when you're fasting, you actually produce NAD. So this is why it's actually, you shouldn't have actually less energy 
but you may feel less energy on the outside because of the dehydration, because of the change in your routine. But in the cellular level, it's actually working for you. But some other amazing thing that's working for you, and we're going to get to the ketones in a minute. But when you are in a stress state, like state of fasting, your body is in, not in a conservation state. So that's why you may feel like your metabolism is lower. You may feel a little bit colder. And this is all true because your body is trying to conserve it. But on the deeper level, the cellular level, it's actually activating not only the uh, mitochondrial function, it's also activating longevity genes, which are also uh, fueled by NAD. So fasting is actually a metabolic fuel in the short term. Now, that's why it's so important that after you break fast, that you don't negate all those benefits. You've got to capture that. You're, you're getting all these beautiful things. And the third one is, if you don't give yourself glucose, then there's no need to spike insulin. That's a phenomenal way to get people to lose weight. That's a phenomenal way to begin to reverse fatty liver disease. In fact, I'm going to give you an amazing story of lowering blood pressure in two weeks because of this. It was actually using some other method, but similar principles. So when we're talking about insulin, you don't need insulin if you don't consume. So if people are on medication to produce insulin, they need to reduce it mm -hmm. during the time that they're fasting. That includes insulin. Now, we're not here to diagnose and treat. So anything that we say of, of, the, of this conversation is for information, education purposes. You must use this information and discuss it with your doctor for fine line. But I'm an MD. So I'm going to tell you that I have a very simple rule of thumb. It doesn't matter whether they're diet controlled diabetic, pill controlled diabetic, insulin controlled diabetic. Everybody can fast because it's very simple. If you don't put any sugar in, then you don't need any, any insulin. So if you're on insulin treatment, if you're going to be fasting, you don't need that much insulin. You can literally half the dose of your insulin, half the long acting and stop the short acting because the short acting is really designed before meals. So the long acting is a steady state. So you can just reduce it by half. That's what I would do with my patient. I'm not telling the patients or people in the audience. So let me ask you this. Let's let's stop for just a second because that's really good advice. One of the things for folks during Ramadan, but not just during Ramadan, for anybody who's thinking about or does practice some sort of fasting outside of Ramadan on a daily or a bi-daily or some sort of regular schedule, breaking your fast strategically. Let's just focus on that for one second because I think a lot of people, after a whole day of fasting, you're hungry and you're going to go for what sounds best, you know? So let's talk about what would be some wise choices in terms of food selection or just the order of operations and breaking a fast, for example. So not necessarily don't eat this, but if you're going to eat this, maybe try to start with this. Let's yeah, talk about so, that a little bit. Yeah. Let me talk about, uh, first of all, what are the nutrient sensing pathways and what happens when you fast? If you're eating glucose, you activate what we call IGF-1. If you're eating protein, you activate something called mTOR. Now, those are good for you because mTOR makes you grow muscles. That's why protein is good for you. The insulin-like growth factor is a surrogate for growth hormone. So when you eat, you, you grow, you're anabolic. Now, when you stop, when you don't eat anything, you're blocking those nutrient-sensing pathways. So you're down-regulating, you're decreasing IGF-1, you're decreasing um, uh, uh, mTOR, but you're also increasing something called AMPK, which is a metabolic switch. So again, fasting just got your cellular metabolism up with AMPK. It down-regulated those two other things, and that's the health benefit. When you down-regulate those two things, your body is now going to activate longevity genes. It's going to have micro mitochondrial biogenesis. That means making more mitochondria, making the electron transfer chains more efficient. I'm going to discuss if we have time how inefficiency is loss of electrons. It's an inefficient metabolism. It's not a good thing. You, by fasting, you clean up, you repair your mitochondria so you get the most efficient fuel and the efficiency is the best for the long term. Short term, yeah, you may have more thermogenesis with an inefficient system, but the long term, you don't have a healthy mitochondria. So the health of the mitochondria is important. So let's look at fasting again. It's down-regulating all those signals. That's activating longevity genes. That's activating metabolism on a cellular level. So that's all ready for you. Now, when you're breaking fast, if you're not careful and you just have a surge of glucose, you're going to have a surge in the IGF-1 as well as insulin. You're going to have a surge in mTOR with lots of protein. 
And you may not want to do that right at the offset of the breaking the fast. So the number one thing not to do when you break your fast is to have refined carbs. That includes juices. That includes fruit juices. That includes soda. That includes your, you know, there's a drink called Rafza. It's a red drink. They kind of make a lemonade with it or just have it with plain water. It's sugar. You do not want to throw away all that benefit of mitochondrial activation, longevity gene activation, down-regulating all the, 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 the pathways that could actually create too much growth in a bad way, right? Sure. Uh, this is a good time to say that this is for adults. This conversation is about adults with common medical problems. We, and we can br bring some examples of outliers, but this is designed for the majority. The outliers, we need to have a more one-on-one -on -one conversation. So this is not a conversation for people less than 18. I could even hazard a guess less than 16. Sure. But you know, it just depends more on your physiology and your size, not your age really, in as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so, so in a nutshell, by fasting, you're downregulating insulin, which is a really good way to get healthy, downregulating um, you know, those growth pathways. So in a way, you're activating so many other things. So when you're breaking the fast, don't break it with sweet things. Now, it's prophetic to break it with what we call the date, kajur, right? Oh. The dates, the manjun dates is so big. You know, can you see how big that is? It is equivalent to 14 grams of sugar, which is two teaspoons. Now, it's not the same. I, get, I grant it. Uh, uh, you know, a, a date is more a more of a wholesome food that has minerals in it and fibers in it, uh, and there is value in it. But as far as the insulin is concerned, it's the same. It's the same. It's going to have a surge of insulin. You're going to dampen the. You're going to have a surge in IGF one. When really, uh, the blunting those pathways in fasting is the benefit. So you want to keep that going. So the best way to break the fast is something that is high in fat. Mm -hmm. So fat means your olive oil, fat means your coconut, your uh, olives itself, coconut, the fat means avocado. So av fat means, you know, nuts and seeds. I know it's very difficult to break your fast that way. But for me, I like to break my fast by drinking water and maybe taking a bite of a date, but having some nuts or having some dish, which is part of the main dish, not having like fruits at the beginning. I would have it at the end of the meal. I would have a, a, like a soup like a stew, which we call halim. Now, you can make so many variations of it because the principle of halim is a protein base. You can have chicken or you can have some red meat. You don't need a lot of it, so it's okay. Then you just put a whole bunch of uh, lentils in it, different types of lentils and different types of beans. Some people put grains. Now, we can discuss about grains, but barley in essentially can be healthy. Whole wheat can be healthy. You know, buckwheat or millet can be healthy. And then you've got quinoa. Quinoa doesn't go so well with uh, with, with this kind of dish because oh, it kind of melts. It's soggy. Yeah. It gets soggy. Exactly. You got it. So you, you cook. That's why you, you understand. But you know, people know what I mean by halim. It's not a piece of toast. It's not a samosa. It's not, uh, you know, those comfort foods like pakora. They, you know, sometimes they're not always that bad because some of the pakora are made out of gram flour. Gram flour mm -hmm. is chickpeas. Chickpeas is protein. But the problem is they fry it, right? Now, mm -hmm. if you fried it in coconut oil or some degree of low heat olive oil, it wouldn't be so bad. So one of the things you're going to learn about breaking fast is that when you break your fast and you combine fat and carbohydrate, that's your perfect storm of really doing some damage. So we can elaborate in a minute because, I mean, I've been talking too much. <laughs> so t give me no, your example of no, uh, how you would break your fast. I, I agree with you. I think a lot of times with clients, what I recognize when we're first starting to discuss dietary strategies for people who have unhealthy relationships with food or just trying to figure out a way to start to move in the right direction is a lot of times people misinterpret thirst for hunger. That's number one. A lot of people are underhydrated. So a good rule of thumb for the average individual is to shoot for about half of your body weight in ounces of water per day. And then if you're an active individual and you're sweating a lot, you need to increase that number. So let's just say if you're a 200 pound individual um, or you're a, you weigh 100 kilograms, we want to go for 100 ounces of water a day, roughly. Um, so that's number one. So I like the idea that before you even consume any whole food, you have a little bit of water. Take the edge off. Get rid of some of those hunger pangs that might just be related to the thirst. The other aspect that I agree with is starting with something that has mm, a substantial amount of fat. And the reason is because we're talking about this idea of trying to minimize spikes in insulin. When you have fat 
in your gut and it going through the digestion process, what that does is that helps slow down the digestion of anything else that comes in close to the timing that you consume that. Slower digestion is helpful in minimizing the amount of insulin that's released at any given moment. So one of the worst things that anybody can do, especially when it comes to trying to control insulin and blood sugar, is to drink smoothies and fruit juices that are all blended up, particularly with tropical fruits, things like bananas, pineapples, mangoes, those sorts of things. Because what you've effectively done, if you look at the way that food grows in nature and fruits grow in nature, they have a skin or a pulp and they have, they have this natural fibrous component. And part of what that does is it slows down the absorption rate of those sugars, that fructose that's in that fruit as well. So when you blend something up and then you ingest it rapidly, specifically fruit, you've sort of eliminated the function of the fiber. And now all of those sugars hit the bloodstream much more rapidly and create a much greater surge in insulin. And then round and round we go. Okay. So if we're trying to avoid that, I completely agree. I think for me personally, what I do because I fast daily is I, I hydrate on the front end of the day. I make sure that I'm getting plenty of water before I consume a first meal. I actually typically exercise fasted as well. And then I give myself a little bit of time following a workout for my body to maximize the hormonal benefits of exercise because there's a lot of those to be had. And then within an hour to two hours, I'm usually hungry by then and I've usually been fasting for 16 hours or so. Then I'll have some significant source of fat and some protein. Um, and we've talked about this in the past, but I tend to implement a fair amount of resistance training in my routine. So protein is pretty important for me just from a recovery aspect. And another thing that people also should consider about protein as it relates to metabolism is protein has what we call the, um, the highest requirement in terms of energy to process meaning the thermogenic effect of food. So when we consume food, it elevates our core temperature because of digestion. It just, everything has to work a little bit harder. So naturally our core temperature elevates a little bit as a, as a result of that. But protein actually increases metabolic activity more so than fats and carbohydrates. That's a generalization, but typically speaking. So for me, a little bit of fat, a little bit of protein, and then if I am having carbohydrates, which I'll typically only do if it's been a particularly tough workout, is some sort of fresh fruit intact. So I'll make sure that I'm eating the skin or the pulp or whatever, the entire, the entire fruit. Um, or I'll do some combination of a little bit of fruit and possibly uh, a little bit of honey. And the reason that I like honey is I prefer natural forms of food in general, but honey does a really good job of replenishing what we call liver glycogen. And liver glycogen is one of those sources that we rely on when we're in a fasted state for energy, particularly during exercise. Glycogen is just a fancy term for stored carbohydrate. So you store glycogen in both the muscle tissue as well as your liver. And honey does a really good job of replenishing that liver glycogen. So those will be my two primary sources of sugar slash carbohydrates. And generally speaking, only after a more challenging workout. So that's the way that I usually approach it. Yeah. Real quick uh, advice uh, for people who may be uh, on the borderline uh, diabetic side. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important that they don't start with the, like you said, the uh, smoothie or the fruits or the juice or even the date. Uh, because, you know, the, that's going to spike the sugar right away. And then uh, even worse than that, then the insulin spike. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, so let's look at the benefits again of fasting. So one of the things that we said is that um, you like to work out before the breaking the fast. I'm the same way because once I've eaten, I just don't want to move. I think that's part of it. The vagus nerve gets stimulated. So when you're fasting, you actually release more amino acids into your body. Leucine is the most abundant amino acid. You actually release it. There's a reason for that because your body wants to protect itself. Most of the protein in your body, half of it at least, is recycled. So, you know, a young uh, fit guy like uh, Vic who works out, he may need a little bit more than the average person, but 50% of your protein is recycled. So you only need the 50% from your dietary intake. It's important to get the, that the recycling. And that is also 
optimized through fasting and a few other things like sauna. It's, it's called the three-dimensional protein structure. It's not just protein bits and pieces sticking together. It actually has a three-dimensional structure, which can become uh, untangled. And, um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And how folded exciting. proteins. Yeah, folded proteins become misfolded. And so aging does that. Um, having high sugar does that. Um, stress oxidation, all the bad things like inflammation. So if you have blood pressure, if you have diabetes, if you have all these things, you are actually in a more catabolic state. You're breaking down. And part of that breakdown process is your proteins that are three-dimensional are now misfolded. They're no longer three-dimensional. The way to make them refold is like fasting and sauna. That The sauna creates what we call the heat shock proteins, and heat shock proteins can refold those proteins into a three-dimensional structure. So when you're fasting, not only are you releasing amino acids, so that will sustain your muscles, frankly. You shouldn't waste away provided you break your fast properly. The other thing is that you release growth hormone. So there's something called ghrelin. When you're uh, hungry, your stomach is releasing that hunger hormone called ghrelin. G-H-R-E-L-I-N. Ghrelin. Sounds like gremlins, doesn't it? Um, and it's mean. Hungry ghrelin is mean because, coming. yeah, it makes you feel hungry. You want to eat. But uh, resisting it is actually the benefit. And that ghrelin is called a growth hormone releasing hormone. So by day when you're fasting, you're actually releasing growth hormone. You've released amino acids. You're in a prime recovery state. You're cleaning up misfolded proteins. You're activating AMPK, which is a metabolic switch. We can just say that. It may not be metabolism, but it's the metabolic switch ready to give you that metabolic boost when you break your fast if you don't break it with refined carbohydrates, right? And that applies to everybody, but particularly if you have insulin resistance, particularly if you have belly fat, particularly if you have fatty liver, particularly if you have propensity for the cardiometabolic problem. That's why this month is the beginning of healing your disease because once you're fasting, as you said, you will burn the stores in your liver and you will burn the stores of glycogen in your muscle. So the glycogen stores in your liver may be up to 200 milligrams. The glycogen stores in your muscle, I think it's a little less, about 100 milligrams. But those are plenty to give you the immediate breakdown into glucogenesis. That means the release of glucose. Then once that's over, as Vic was saying, your body will turn to other sources of fuel. If you don't give it carbohydrates, you don't give it a, any proteins, you don't give it any fat, it's going to turn to your own body fat after it uses up the stores. Now, bear in mind, everybody has different levels of stores. Some people have plenty of stores. That means that they need days before they start to eat into their body fat. But they will if they persist. Only if they don't store up and stock up during the breaking of the fast with too much, right? Mm -hmm. So if you like, you can uh, use honey after the workout, but you're an athlete. You're a fine-tuned machine. You don't <laughs> have a lot of reserves. But the average person that has days of reserve but they, don't, they, they barely finish the fasting and they stock up again. Yeah. They yeah. stock up after the fasting is over. And guess what? We're allowed to eat before we start the fast. I see people stocking up again. It's like, I can't believe my eyes. It's like, right. do you have the appetite to eat that much in the morning? Anyway, I'm getting a little bit too uh, mean here. So let me be nice and friendly and show you all the benefits to really enjoy yourself. So let's talk about that. So you're fasting. We talked about so many health benefits of fasting. You're using up those stores. You know what fatty liver is? It's full of fat. You know why you have fat? Because you have excess carbs and the body stores triglyceride in a way that you can get fuel by breaking it down. But if you don't break it down, it's going to get stored in the liver. It's going to get stored in the muscle fiber. Even if you don't have obvious fat on the outside, you'll have fat inside the body. We call that visceral fat. It's very inflammatory. So if you have liver fat, that's called fatty liver. If you have fat around your organs, it's called ectopic or visceral fat. These are very inflammatory. They are part of those sort of cytokine storm that you hear about with COVID. This is the unhealthy people on the inside, even if you're not fat on the outside. Yeah. Okay. So it's very important to understand that. And um, so if you use up those stores, then you start to break fat. Your body will take those free fatty acids, take it to the liver, and the liver, provided it's healthy, will create the ketones. Not everybody's equal. That's why it's so important to look at the global health. It's not just you know one diet uh, is a, a fit for all. Everybody's you know reserves are different. Their metabolism is different. Their health of the liver is different. That's on a very personalized medicine level. So on that level, let me just uh, reintroduce myself. I am an internal medicine physician, 
but I'm actually a functional doctor. I can actually tell you when your function is going down because yeah. when your function is going down, that comes way before disease. In fact, you get uh, dysfunction before you get disease. What is that? That's when you're borderline something, right? You've got fatigue, you've got low energy, you've got more body fat, your hormones are not right. And the doctor says, well, you know, you don't have diabetes, you don't have blood pressure, you don't have heart disease, you must be fine. And that's called dysfunction. So this, yeah. my job is to be able to identify these things because this is part of understanding all these metabolic pathways. There are many, many fine-tuned labs, but it's not the lab that you use for diagnosing disease. If you're using those labs, you can't uh, predict these things. You have to use what we call functional labs. So we have, I'm an MD, so it is actually grounded in science. And everything we just said is the breakthroughs in science that we can actually replicate with what we call intermittent fasting or fasting mimicking diet. But the real thing is fasting, and which, which is prescribed on us, so we have no choice. The main thing is that you are definitely fasting by day, not eating, not drinking. So break your fast with water. Don't juice because, uh, uh, first of all, don't blend into a smoothie because you're increasing the surface area. Not only are you at risk of you know, not eating the pulp and the fibers, but uh, you're, you're, you're increasing the surface area because when you're chewing, you can only break it down so much. Blending is like, I don't know how many, is a thousand revs a minute. It's, it's ridiculous. That's not, uh, that, that's only for people who can't so, say eat, right? So I just don't like that kind of blending. Now, just real quick, because I'm going on too much. Now, juicing is really out of the question. So you tell me that you juice spinach. Great. You tell me you juice kale. You tell me you juice celery. Celery is the only thing that's acceptable, by the way, and cucumber maybe. But if you juice anything, whether it's carrots or, or spinach or kale, they do have some fructose. Now, when you have those vegetables, there's only this much juice for maybe, you know, this much vegetable, right? Can you see it? Yep. Okay. Now, who stops with this much juice? They don't. So you're going to put more vegetable to get more juice. So yep. as you get more juice, that's still fructose. So whether it's fruits that have fructose or vegetables that have fructose, it's just that fruits have, especially tropical fruit, higher glycemic index, so more fructose. If they're berries, raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, they have low glycemic index, so you won't have as much sugar in that. And even vegetables have uh, fructose, but much less. But if you're juicing and thinking it's healthy and you're having this much juice, that's the same amount of fructose as this much orange juice, which is the same as this much soda, as far as I'm concerned. When it comes to the immediate effects of the spike in sugar, then the spiking in insulin, and it's the spike in insulin that creates insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is a state where the insulin remains high because it's a global phenomenon. It's not just that temporary meal. And when the insulin remains high, your body is in a state of storage. You cannot break burn fat. So remember, I was going to tell you the worst food to break your fast, the worst food at any time is when you combine fat, particularly unhealthy fat, mass-produced fat, uh, um, commercialized fat like canola, olive oil, I mean, you know, canola, sapphire oil, things like that. Frankly, even olive oil, if you use high heat, you're saturating it. The only oils that are, are safe in high heat is coconut oil and, um, and uh, to some degree, avocado oil and uh, ghee, clarified butter. Those are already saturated, but in a healthy way. So if you're having a commercialized fats, which you're frying your food, and you have refined carbs, your body will always burn the carb first. If it's burning the carb first, it can only turn on one metabolic pathway at a time. That means that all the fat that you just consumed, that has to be stored. So in a day of fasting, when you're using up your glycogen stores, and you break your fast with not only carb, but a carb that's fried, then that carb will stop the ability to burn fat right away. And any fat you have will go to storage. So you can actually come out of Ramadan worse off than you went in. You can come out of Ramadan metabolically destroyed. You can come out of Ramadan gaining weight, which I find incredibly difficult yeah. to understand. But I do understand because yeah. people are hungry. They get hungry with the eyes. They're thirsty. So you <clears throat> give yourself some time. That ghrelin is in your body. It's giving you that hunger. When you stretch your stomach with water, it's going to satisfy you a little bit. Have some tea or something. Have uh, something like uh, uh, hummus. Hummus is chickpeas. Put plenty of oil on it, right? Now you're going to say, well, Dr. Habib, didn't you just say, or oh, mixing fat and carbohydrates? But hummus is protein. Right. You can make hummus or uh, that kind of blended protein with any type of lentils. Um, so one of the things that we fry 
uh, which again would be slightly would be better than having a fried um, samosa. Uh, uh, it would be like a what we call a um, a patty made out of a, a rehydrated lentil. So the the, the soaking in water mm -hmm. hydrates it to a degree. You mm -hmm. can blend it. Now that becomes the base, not a starchy base, not a carbohydrate. It's a protein base. So we put some seasoning in there, some onions, some green chilies, maybe a little turmeric. You can put coriander. You just season it up. You make it into a patty, and then we fry it in olive oil, or we fry it in coconut oil, or better still, we use clarified butter. Because now, clarified butter has been shown that the short-chain fatty acids in clarified butter is actually fuel for metabolism. Short-chain fatty acids is fuel for micro microbes, the good bacteria. That's probably why it supports metabolism because the a happy micro, happy metabolism. So that's why vegetables are good for you. It's happy for the microbes, good for the microbe. You have good metabolism. So, so frying it in ghee now has given me short chain fatty acids. The clarified butter is actually uh, very nurturing for the good bacteria in your body, in the gut, I should say. And you've got a patty made of protein and not carbohydrate. That is, you know, I don't do that personally that much because, you know, I, I just don't want that much oil. Uh, at the beginning of my fast. I wanted to eat my meal. I should just stop talking for a second, Vic. You can no, 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 no. So let's talk about coming out of Ramadan for folks who maybe don't fast otherwise. That's not their common yeah. practice. Or even if it is, or even for people who are listening to this and deciding, you know, I, I don't normally fast outside of Ramadan, but I'm going to start to try. I would like to do two things. I would like to do one, I would like to maybe suggest a general protocol that somebody who is looking to start to fast on a regular basis beyond Ramadan can implement as a starting yeah. point for fasting. And then the second thing that I want to maybe touch on is we talked about metabolism and dysfunction. What are some signs, some very common signs and symptoms that an individual might be experiencing if they are suffering from a dysfunctional metabolism. So they don't necessarily have access to blood paneling or they, they think that oh, they're really? otherwise pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. What are some you know common red flags that they can start to watch for? Because mm -hmm. they may start to yeah. revert back to their normal behaviors yeah. and those pathologies might return. Yeah, so this one, is so simple. Um, let's start yeah. with the fasting protocol just yeah. real quick and then we'll go to the red flags. Yeah, yeah. So the, the start with that again. The the, uh, the fasting fast. protocol, a general fasting protocol that mm -hmm. somebody okay. who wants to fast beyond Ramadan could practice. Yeah. Necessarily Correct. doesn't want to go to the extreme of you no know, sunrise to sunset. Sure, sure. Let's just start. Before that, let's say if people have like complex medical issues or they have, they're on prescription medication, they have fears, their doctor has never brought this up, actually says the opposite, that is dangerous. If you want a one-on-one -on -one with us, whether it's me as a medical doctor, whether it's Vic, who is an expert in the lifestyle, we can actually put the science for you and do it in a safe manner. So at Next Health, so if you want to look us up, it's nexthealthmed.com, like the word next health. Dot, uh, med dot right com. The so like yeah, it. and uh, I think there you see the phone number on the screen right there. That's mm -hmm. one way to reach out. So once we do a consultation, then uh, we can combine our skills together, and we have what we call you know virtual fitness and nutrition. We have uh, you can do for virtual physicals as well. So now to answer your question, look, uh, it's all based on the individual. We do have studies, right? We do have studies. So let's go by the study, and then you can extrapolate it because study is based on the people in the study. And if you're not of that gender, of that size, of that race, you know, you can't extrapolate, you can't say the gospel, but you can extrapolate. So, look, let me tell you an amazing uh, fasting study that, that, that happened. They call it the intermittent fasting mimicking diet or fasting mimicking diet or intermittent fasting. And all they did, and I was going to go over the protocol, but out of a month, just five days of fasting using products that they could eat during the day, which amounted to about 500 calories. But they weren't just 500 calories from anything. You know, I hear even doctors talking about just calories. It's just calories. There is some truth. If you have caloric restriction, it's good all around. But where you get the calories is even more important. And if you combine the two, reduce the caloric intake and know where those calories come from, you're way ahead. So instead of fighting about calories is more important than this, it's like, let's look at the detail. So the, the intermittent fasting mimicking diet reduced blood pressure. It reduced blood sugar. It reduced inflammation of all things. No drug for inflammation, by the way. It reduced abdominal weight, uh, girth, the, 
So the point is all those parameters, the cardiometabolic metabolic spectrum, were all managed with intermittent fasting. So what is this intermittent fasting? I don't usually plug other companies. It's called Prolon, P-R-O-L-O-N. So the, but remember Next Health, because Next Health will give you all the names. <laughs> so Prolon. So the good news is that they've got studies. You know, the, the thing is that a lot of skeptical people out there, and absolutely rightly so. But there is so much data. Don't let skepticism blind you. Don't let your doctor's ignorance blind you. Skepticism is great, but ignorance is not acceptable. So when a doctor gives you advice about your B12 levels are too high because you're taking B12 supplements, it's because they're measuring what's in the blood. They're not measuring what's in the cells. In the cells is steady state over months. What's in the blood is up and down based on what you ate and didn't eat. So what looks high is because you got loaded with it. But all the load doesn't all enter the cells. So I just wanted to throw in there because I know there's sure, people yeah. in the audience right. that have been told who are conscientious about vitamins and they've been told that the B12, and particularly B12, because that really absorbs very fast, and even folic acid, those are common vitamins. And, and yet they don't uh, hark on about vitamin D, which doesn't go up that fast, by the way. So that one takes a little bit more and you want to be living around 50 if you're a normal person. That's where the longest uh, studies show that that's the best health. If you best health outcome from every aspect, cardiovascular health, bone density, if you want, if you have disease or if you have other challenges, you need to go higher. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. Going back to the fasting. So what it is that in a five-day plan, what they have is a box that has some soups. The soups have low calories. It, they fill you up. They've got some nice ingredients in there that are uh, satisfying, should we say. Mm -hmm. They supply bars in, in between uh, those soups. Like you may get two soups in a day, and in between you get snacks. Those bars are primarily fat made of coconut. And they give you things like olives, the things we just talked about, right? Remember we said when you break your fast, find some fatty stuff. Not easy, but just try. Try to make something appetizing, like having a, you know, if you don't have nut allergy, make a nut salad, you know? So what we would do, you know, we, our, many of our salads, we garnish our tomatoes and onion and, um, uh, and lettuce and cucumbers. We put some onions, we put some chilies, we put some cilantro. So what you could do is, instead of the salad or put the salad and put some nuts in it, right? Yeah. Salad is pretty low, low calories. I mean, uh, other than uh, celery and cucumber, you know, the tomatoes don't have any calories really, as far as I can tell. And yeah. lettuce, it, so you could, you could put more nuts in there, right? Mm -hmm. You could have a salad with lots of beans in there. Now I get it. Now someone's gonna say, well, that's not appetizing. Well, why don't you grill some shrimp? Put that on there. Okay, you want grilled chicken? Put that on there. I know oh, that's dry. This is just a starter. You're going to have your main meal in a minute. See, I'm a kind doctor. I'm giving you nice tips. Anyway, <laughs> let's go back to intermittent fasting. The intermittent fasting was basically packaged stuff. It's not this gourmet meal, but it's satisfied so they weren't hungry. They could go throughout the day. They got their satisfaction from fats. The fats were from olives. The fats were, were coconut. And they all amounted to just 500 calories. Now, you may say, well, yes, you'd lose weight on 500 calories. That's true. That's the caloric restriction. But it didn't negate those nutrient sensing pathways that are blocked in fasting. When you're fasting, that means you're not eating anything. It's the same pathways that were that, you know, that the, the fasting blocked those pathways. This intermittent fasting mimicked it. It because mimicked it. it. Didn't, because it didn't spike insulin. It didn't. That, there was no carbohydrates, no refined carbs, no carbohydrates in there. There wasn't a lot of protein. It was m like a keto diet, right? Which is very difficult because people turn to, you know, meat products and, uh, and processed products. I won't mention the dirty B word. That's a meat made uh, uh, starts with the B. Uh, but that's what people turn to. They think, well, uh, it's protein and fat. Uh, they must be great. But usually it's dirty protein, dirty fat. We're, we're talking about clean stuff. Plant protein is clean. Plant fats is clean. And then, you know, you got to make it appetizing with the fatty fishes, shall we say. You know, you can, you can get adventurous. You know, like uh, my daughter's going to make uh, some wraps with uh, thin rice paper flour. You know what those are? Mm -hmm. What do they call it? I yeah. don't eat it much. You know, you know what? You go to a Chinese store. Like yeah. where you get a spring roll or something like that. Exactly, but not the flour. It's made out of rice. It's a thin sheet. And it's more for texture than anything. And she'll fill that up with stuff, right? We can fill it with some chicken. We can fill it up with some vegetables, some scallions. Oh, scallions, you know, scallions or what we call it, uh, spring onions. Mm -hmm. They are part of the leek family. They have fibers which are indigestible. So they travel to the colon without being broken down. 
is soluble fiber is fine. They lower cholesterol, but insoluble fiber, non-digestible fibers like celery, like uh, leeks. Actually, did I say celery? Yeah, artichokes definitely, and um, and spring onions. They call them scallions. They are nutrition for the bacteria in the gut. When bacteria get fiber, that's their fuel. They feed off the fiber to make short-chain fatty acids because that's the fuel for the bacteria. So when you have ghee or butter, clarified butter, that's the short-chain fatty acids that's already fuel for the bacteria. They don't need to make it from the fiber. I just threw in you know, some of the conversation here. I have a question for you. Is Are there any common fermented foods um, that are consumed widely during Ramadan? You know, not really, but uh, the closest. So let's talk about the common ones that we hear about, right? Okay. Kimchi, sauerkraut, um, you know, um, what else? Name it, give me a miso soup. Another one. Apple yeah. cider vinegar is one that people like to throw in there. Right. Things like that. So in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the cultures where, you know, people are fasting, you know, that is not very European, should we say. So the closest thing that we can have is vegetables that are pickled in vinegar. Now, mm -hmm. as you correctly said, I think any vinegar would probably do, but apple cider vinegar has many more uh, healthy properties about it. Uh, it's, it's good for the acid in your stomach. Antibacterial, antimicrobial. Exactly. So when you have this layer of good acid, it's better for digestion. And if you have a layer of acid, it protects you from invading bacteria. That's the, the whole essence of putting in something acidic. Because it's, it's contradictory that you're putting acid into somebody's stomach who may have a problem. They have a problem because they have poor acid. And that right. poor acid means poor bacteria. And poor bacteria means poor gut motility. So if things are not moving down, they reflux up. That's gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, right? Gastritis is burning in the stomach. GERD is reflux. And both of those happen when you have poor acid, not more acid. You get bad acid when you smoke. Smoke actually causes more acidity. You get bad acid if you have bad fats. You have bad acid. Uh, it's really not even just bad acid. It's poor well, lining in the gut is, is part of the problem. Uh, going back to the foods, pickling them in anything, you know, some root vegetables, any vegetables, you know, it could be cauliflower, carrots, it could be, uh, you know, radish, I think is a common one that people are using there. But you could pickle anything. People pickle garlic. Garlic is another source of uh, mm -hmm. fiber that the microbes love. So pickling, I always say I'm going to do it. I never do it. You can pickle some chilies. You can pickle some garlic. You can pickle anything you want. So I think that's the closest that we get. And what pickling does is it really gets your taste buds going, right? Um, which may be good, maybe bad. I think it gets it going in a good way. You know, when you're hungry and you're famished and your stomach and you eat with your eyes. But when you put the pickles in, it, it does something to the taste buds, which I think gets your digestion ready, right? So it gets your appetite, but I don't think it gets you going in the way that you crave a burger. You know, you crave a burger when you're when you just got an empty stomach. Ravenous. When yeah, you're, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's just to summarize. First things first, anybody who's thinking about trying to incorporate some sort of fasting moving forward outside of the holiday or beyond, you can start with something as simple as just trying to eat a more modest amount of food right. and primarily focusing on high quality fats along with your wide array of color in terms of vegetables. We can keep it that simple. Is that fair to say as just yep. a starting point? Yep. Yep. Okay. So the, the second question was, what are some red flags that folks can keep an eye out for that might be signs. common indications yep. or signs yep. of metabolic dysfunction? So as you and I know, mitochondria is fuel, but that fuel has to be in every cell in the body. The organs that require the maximum amount of fuel, like the heart, the liver, uh, uh, certain tissues like spleen, they're highly metabolically active, so they require more density of mitochondria. But mitochondria is in your brain cell, it's in your nerve cell, the blood vessel cell, it's in the liver. Let me give you some examples so it can open your eyes. When we get a biopsy of a fatty liver, we can actually see that the mitochondrial shape has been literally destroyed. And if you do a biopsy and you look for the ATP, that's the energy production, it's very minimal. So it's a low energy state when you damage the mitochondria. So that's a, so I'm going to give you signs and symptoms in a minute. Once you can visualize the devastation that happens when we say, ah, oh, you know, the mitochondria is yeah, damaged. You've got many more, right? No problem. So let me tell you about dementia. Dementia is a low energy state. 
low energy because of insulin resistance. It doesn't allow efficient metabolism of glucose. That's what they call it diabetes type 3. So do not have refined carbs if you have propensity for dementia. Do not have refined carbs if you have the APOE gene like I do. You have to be careful with certain environment. That's why you need to seek some professionals to be able to predict who's going to get dementia, who's going to get blockages, who's going to get arthritis. Now, what are the symptoms? So the blood pressure is a symptom of low mitochondrial function. So what would that be? That would So you don't know blood pressure unless you know how to measure it. That would be sluggish exercise, right? You just kind of poop out because you're, you, you, you haven't stimulated the mitochondria. So one of the reasons why exercise is good for you, you're stimulating biogenesis of the mitochondria mitochondrial biogenesis. You're going to increase the density. In fact, muscles have high density of, of mitochondria, but the more you use it, the more mitochondria. So a sign of disuse, disuse like deconditioning would be indirectly damaging the mitochondria. So if you're sore, that, that's a sign. If you don't have endurance, that's a sign. And the answer is to build it up slowly. So a fatty liver, you may not be able to see it unless you see an ultrasound. Sometimes liver enzymes are elevated. But a fatty liver is one that cannot detoxify. So you may feel sluggish. Your body may feel worse after a meal than when you are hungry, frankly. I feel better during the day. Of course, I'm a little tired. Now I'm talking. I've got my energy back. But, you know, I'm going to take a little nap. And uh, so, but the thing is that um, that's low mitochondrial function means low energy. If the cells don't have energy, they don't function. So your brain cells are fog. You've got energy that is low. You've got mm -hmm. hormones that don't seem to work mm -hmm. because they all need fuel. So let, let me tell you about hormones. Where the hormones, where are hormones produced? So let's say something simple. Let's say estrogen, because you know people think hormone is just estrogen. But let me tell you, cortisol is a hormone, mm -hmm. insulin is a hormone, thyroid is a hormone, and there are other sex hormones and there are non-sex hormones. So uh, growth hormone. So just want to clarify, there's a lot of hormones and you need a good liver to be able to metabolize them and a fatty liver is not good. Okay, now we're saying that even hormone function is impacted by mitochondrial dysfunction because in that ovary, in order to produce that estrogen and progesterone and cortisol, it comes out of the mitochondria. So there is not another special cell that mitochondria is inside the ovum. You know, the, the, there's follicles and there's uh, follicle stimulating hormones. But <clears throat> all of those, the, the actual final step is in the mitochondria. So if you have a mitochondria that's dysfunctional, that organ is fatigued. So there are many young people with infertility. Mm -hmm. And it could be from many reasons. Insulin resistance actually dis disrupt all hormones. We talked about people that have mm -hmm. insulin resistance. But... Mitochondrial dysfunction also exhausts or is, is, is synonymous with the exhausted organ. So fertility uh, uh, is, a, is a sign, right? You ask me for signs and symptoms, they're having difficulty with fertility. Now, I don't want people to think that that's a diagnosis. It's one of the possibilities, especially if you can't find anything else. So as doctors, we look for insulin resistance because that's a disorder. We look for people that have, uh, you know, uh, uh, adhesions. Uh, chronic infections. So that's a medical part. If you've ex excluded the medical part, now it's all function. There is no functional test for the ovary. But you can be sure that a young ovary has lots of mitochondria and an old ovary has low mitochondria, right? Now, going back to fasting real quick, and you can ask me if you, there's more organ systems. So there's the fog, there's a the low energy, there's a the weight gain, there's a hormonal disruption, there's a the sluggish after a meal. How much more do you want? I you're, think you're, was, yeah. Yeah, most walking people, that's most, what you most want. people can relate to those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, right. so, how do you regenerate mitochondrial function? Remember, I told you it's electron transfers in the mitochondria. They're inefficient when you have fatty liver. They're inefficient in dementia patients. They're inefficient in cardiac patients. They're inefficient in heart failure patients. They're inefficient in diabetes. How much more can I go on? They're inefficient. You're losing the electrons. So short term, you may get so thermogenesis. Long term, you have an organ dysfunction. And then organ dysfunction leads to disease. So how do you reverse disease? Get the function back. Start walking properly. And now recover the mitochondria. How? Fasting. Fasting and uh, intermittent stress, uh, high temperature like saunas, these will recover the, the mitochondrial function. Because the mitochondria is a protein. 
or it has protein in its membrane, should we say. It has mm -hmm. structures in the mitochondria that's mm -hmm. called the ATPase. ATPase is the way you make energy. That's called ATP. But it's in the mitochondria, but it's a three-dimensional protein. It gets misfolded. When you have a fat, a high fat diet, when you live with high sugar, when you have blood pressure, when you have oxidation, when you have inflammation, when you have high homocysteine, you are now damaging the mitochondria, you're damaging the protein, the electrons are leaking, and you need to recover it. You need to recover it by not taking just CoQ10. You don't just recover it, you recover it by making sure those risk factors like blood pressure and blood sugar and homocysteine, you address them whichever way at the beginning. But the true healing is through fasting i've just did so i'll give you one example it's so amazing so i gave them something to bring down insulin resistance rapidly the side effect was they had lower appetite within two weeks their blood pressure went from 160 to 120 that's normal from you know usually i like to bring it down slowly but one. it's so dramatic because by stopping the insulin resistance, I stopped the metabolic disorder right away. And the side effect of the treatment was that he didn't have appetite. And she, it was husband and wife. And they both complained a little bit. But I, I told them, every example of people that had side effects, they wished they, they would do it all over again. And they were so skeptical. Skeptical? Skeptical. I mean, what kind of language is that? It's an it's a exaggerated <laughs> English. That, we know that like, yeah, so, so this... Um, this this th they were another example of somebody that decided to continue on it because the effects were so insulin resistance we should finish on insulin resistance at some point is the root of all hormonal disruption and you get insulin resistance you create insulin resistance by having refined carbs your smoothie your juices anything refined you're creating it the other sources are inflammation and toxicity which we've been talking about and i'm a real doctor telling you so if i'm telling you it's real and any doctor that doesn't understand is because he's uneducated and ignorance is not an excuse. So all these things are mainstream if you know how to apply it, but they don't know how to apply it because they heavily rely on drug. They think the drug is going to fix the blood pressure. They think the drug will fix the diabetes. The drug will fix It does not. It only merely controls it. It only slows it down to the inevitable worsening and final deterioration. Yeah, it seems like anytime you see a, um, a pharmaceutical commercial, they always like to wrap up with this long laundry list of potential side effects and they try to put really happy music to it and very happy looking people and they fire them off so rapidly. But that's because, like you said, it's not it's not a solution. It just provides temporary relief from a very specific symptom. But inevitably leads to the body starting to express the fact that there's an issue going on in other ways yeah, you so can fix the problem yeah for blood pressure and your blood pressure becomes managed but then your body's still trying to alert you that something is still wrong and now maybe you start to suffer from digestive yeah. issues or any number of things so i agree with that so it's just to give you the science uh on blood pressure even, that what I'm saying is actually real science. It's just your doctor doesn't practice it. Just because he doesn't practice it doesn't mean that science is not there. So remember the things that create the mitochondrial dysfunction? One of those is oxidation. So every cardiologist knows about oxidation. They just don't have an antioxidant because that comes in fruits and vegetables. If it's not a prescription, they can't give it to you because it's apparently not medical, right? It should be. So oxidation is the root of blood pressure. Oxidation actually damages what an enzyme that makes nitric oxide nitric oxide it comes out when you exercise it opens up the arteries mm -hmm. so when you don't exercise low nitric oxide no no blood flow if you have oxidation you damage the nitric oxide through an enzyme called nos so so it's real and so the point is that that um that that oxidation is the root of damaging not only the nitric oxide but the mitochondria it's the same thing because all the things we reeled out that are bad for you are damaging the mitochondria. And it's that that is actually giving the disease. But they don't talk about the mitochondria. They think they just block the sugar, block the blood pressure, block the cholesterol. It doesn't solve the problem. So one thing about the drug companies is they're terrible, right? I'm not for them. I'm not against them. In fact, I actually use some drugs in, in certain places to get the results I'm looking for, only to hope, maintain them on a more natural lifestyle, right? It depends on where I get, which spectrum I get the patient. So the drugs that you're mentioning, they'll have somebody with colitis. I mean, colitis means inflammation of the colon. How much worse can you get than bleeding from your butt? 
them bloating and pain. And you know, they have that drug and they have these happy smiley faces. And in those happy smiley faces is lunch. And in that lunch, it's a pizza in their hand. Can you believe it? They're actually subliminally telling you, continue your pizza, just take the drug, everything will be okay. Because yeah. you know, it will be okay for them. You'll never be able to stop the drug because yeah. that pizza is the cause of your inflammatory bowel disease. Well, and and like you said, you and I could probably tail spin off into a million in one conversations based off of some of the things that we touched on today. But I know that you've got a tight schedule and so do I. But um, one thing that I do think w we need to address is that when it comes to anything, you know, you need to have some sort of game plan long term. You need to figure out what your current trajectory is. And if you don't like where that's headed, then you need to figure out a strategy for redirecting your trajectory. So you need to either A, contact professionals who can help you assess where you are. So for example, Next Health obviously is a great option. And there are other amazing doctors of all sorts and other functional medicine practitioners and things like that all over the world. So I'd say if you're not in a, in a place where you can, which nowadays with technology, like you said, you can even have physicals done virtually, but if you're not in a place where you think that you can connect with next health directly, please do yourself a favor and just at least Google functional medical practitioner and just see what comes up functional medicine clinics because a lot of times it is not going to be commonplace in a traditional doctor's office to go through some of the deeper digging and trying to put the pieces together a good friend of mine who's in the the medical field said to me that he works in a, in a level one trauma unit medical university setting and he said that it's really sad how the art of the clinician is becoming lost where people doctors of all kinds are being taught to start with medications from the jump to try to get ahead of any further progression of an ailment or disease and illness, as opposed to trying to look at what's really going on at a fundamental level. Where is that? Where is this all originating from? Um, so one, you need to do yourself a favor and try to connect with somebody who can help you dig a little deeper and see if there are some issues that you might need to address, which in my opinion, the vast majority of people, especially in our country, are suffering from some sort of metabolic dysfunction, whether it's low level or if it's severe, that depends on the person. But I think it's it's very, very present. And then the other thing is you need to try to figure out how to develop a game plan moving forward. And so that can be communicating with somebody like yourself or myself to come up with a nutritional protocol, to come up with an exercise program, to come up with both, to come up with strategies for mitigating stress in other aspects of your life, because it really comes down to three main pillars, in my opinion. You have activity slash exercise. So what do you do with your body? Nutrition. So what are you consuming? And environment. And environment is the most complicated in some ways because there's so many additional layers to that. But how well do you sleep? Why? What are the stressors that you're dealing with on a daily basis? How do those impact your physiology as well as your psychology? Because those are interrelated. And then that can obviously start a, a pretty negative tailspin. So if anybody takes nothing else from this, please look into getting a proper assessment and a thorough physical done. And if you do have some red flags, try to find somebody who can help you come up with a game plan because it doesn't have to be complicated, but it needs to be strategic and it needs to be implemented with consistency. And sometimes when left to our own devices, we don't know which direction to head. We read one thing here and we start trying that. And then all of a sudden we hear something else that's counter to it. So then we, we switch and we start trying this, but that a lot of times doesn't lead very far for most people. Well, Vic, uh, next week, what we can uh, promise the audience is that if they have some questions in advance that they can think about that for next week. And what we'll do is a continuation of this conversation and, and sort of mix up lifestyle with what is the diet, the routine, the schedule, some, some medical knowledge, some science, and really give people really options of how they can fix themselves, really. Okay. Um, yep. if so people, if people have questions that they would really, really like to hear responses to, where can they send questions so that they get to yourself? Yeah, I mean, they can uh, email us. I think you had uh, nexthealthmed.com. 
They can email us, they can message us there. Um, they're welcome to, you know, if they're looking to uh, get some guidance on how to find the right practitioner, they can also reach out to us and we could be a great resource of finding somebody that's close to them or giving them some the right direction. Sure. And if anybody is interested in consultations in regards to exercise and nutrition planning, they can shoot me an email at nextformfit.com or they can reach out to you guys at Next Health there. We, we mentioned earlier on, you and I, we work together with patients that come into your clinics and patients that you consult with. So um, they can reach us anyway. And even if it's just like we said, for a, a question, a phone call, we do complimentary consultations where, you know, we're in the business of trying to help people get better. So we're always happy to connect and to, to provide any help that we can. Um, and then next week, I like the idea of let's do a Q&A and let's talk a little bit yeah. more in depth about a couple of these things and maybe a little bit more in depth on some lifestyle strategies that we yeah. can implement. That, that's so, that's any, any, yeah, any callers with complex medical issues, we'll, we'll answer it for you. Yep. All right, Sounds guys. Um, enjoyable. Yeah, I appreciate your time. And anybody else who is uh, who is listening, please feel free to to follow Dr. Habib or myself there. Reach out to us. We're we're very we're more than happy to answer any questions. So until next time, take care. Yes. Right. Bye bye. Now.